Thank you, Brian. What a great, great hymn. Victory in Jesus. And he plunged me between, beneath the wonderful flood, the grace of God, the blood of Jesus that we, by faith, come into contact when we are baptized into the watery grave of baptism. It's great to be before you this evening. In fact, it's been several weeks now since I've had the privilege of proclaiming the Word of God before this congregation, and I miss it when I don't have that opportunity to preach and teach here, and uh, so glad that Jacob and I can spend time in going back and forth together in preaching and teaching, and uh, it's been a great blessing having him here, and I look forward to uh, the next few weeks and next few months being able to deliver some of our final sermons here for a while. But, uh, but God be praised for the good work that this congregation continues to do. In fact, the slide that you notice above you is, Come Grow With Us. We're glad that you're a part of our assembly. And we want others to be a part of our assembly. And we want people to know that we are dedicated, we are committed to growing the body of Christ. Not just numerically, but we are committed to growing spiritually. And in order for us to do that, in order for that to happen, for us to grow both numerically and spiritually as a people, there are several things that have to be in place. And we've been discussing a lot of those things over the years. And we've discussed that even uh, by implication as we've been discussing this theme this year on that the greatest of these is love. But while there are many important elements to church growth, there is one that we must not leave out. In fact, it is one that we must be constant in. And it's one that everybody can participate in. Sometimes we get the feeling like, well, what can I do? Maybe uh, I'm not very good at evangelizing, though maybe we certainly learn by doing. We learn to ride a bicycle by riding a bicycle. We learn to drive a car by driving a car. We get better at evangelizing by evangelizing. But maybe we feel like that I'm just not very good at that or I don't get to do it very often. Or maybe uh, your talent lies in many places and indeed the body of Christ has many different members that need to all work together. But there is one thing that all of us need to be doing as we think about growing and developing the body of Christ and that is that we all need to be prayer warriors. Now I know that we are familiar with that term. It's used a lot in the religious world. And maybe sometimes we might feel uncomfortable with that term. But I think if you realize that it's in connection with Ephesians 6 and what Paul said about our standing there for having our loins girt about with truth, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, taking the shield of faith, our feet shod with the preparation of the, of the gospel of peace, and also, of course, our taking the sword of the Spirit. And he says then also with prayer and supplication, praying in the Spirit. We go to war. We fight the fiery darts of the wicked one by our going to this battle armed with the Word of God and with prayer. Those are two absolutely fundamentally essential elements to church growth. And so we need prayer warriors. We need all of us to be going to war praying for one another. Maybe there is some difficulty going on in the world, as there often is. We need to be praying about that. What about in our marriages? There is a great uh, movie and book that has just recently been released. And uh, it's a great, great movie. It's called The War Room. And it's about a lady who was encouraging and reminding uh, another woman who was struggling in her marriage relationship to not be fighting with her spouse, but to be praying for him. And certainly when we think about the war that we are involved in, whether it is with the devil that's got into our lives, into our homes, or whether he's gotten into the church, and we certainly know that he's in the world, we need to be battling against those forces with prayer. Now that doesn't really surprise us when we think about, just as we see there, a sampling of the verses that I've put there about the importance and the value of prayer. That men ought to always pray and not to faint. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. That we ought to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. That we ought to watch and be sober and be prayerful. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 7. And then James 5, 17 says that we ought to confess our faults one to another. And that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man 
avails much. Well, I don't have to tell this congregation and this group of people about the importance and the value of prayer. Because I know this congregation values and appreciates and loves the Word of God. And you know, in fact, what the Bible teaches about the necessity and the importance of prayer. But maybe if you're like me, sometimes you may be lacking in this area. And maybe you feel like that you're really not growing in this grace. Maybe you feel like that you don't always know what to pray and how to pray it. Or what to say in your prayers. Or maybe you find yourself saying the same things over and over and over again. The truth is that we learn often, that is, or often we learn how to pray by listening to other people. Uh, the disciples discovered that. Uh, uh, they knew that. In fact, in Luke 11 verse 1, when they heard the Lord praying and they saw Him praying, after He finished His prayer, they said, Lord, teach us to pray like John taught His disciples to pray. Now, you think about that. These were Jewish men that had grown up going to the synagogue. They had grown up around all of these festivals and festivities, the, the celebrations of God's grace, as Jacob spoke about this morning in the book of Leviticus, His goodness. Did they not know about praying? Had they not heard many prayers prayed over their years of development and growth? No doubt. I think when they heard the Lord pray, there was something different about how he prayed. There was something that revealed perhaps a zeal and a fervor and, a, and an intimacy with God. That would then follow with their desire to say, God, teach us. Lord, teach us to pray. Now, these are grown men again. Now, I'm... 30-something now, a little over that, I guess. I'm a grandpa. But I want to tell you, there was a lot in preparing for this lesson tonight and in a series of lessons of three I'm going to give on Sunday nights as I have the opportunity over the next few weeks about learning how to pray because it taught me that I needed to grow, that I needed to be more conscientious about what I'm praying about and how to do it. We learn to pray by praying, but we also learn to pray by observing others and hearing how they pray. When I uh, remember several years ago, I remember what took place several years ago in our house when Micah was just about four or five years old and, and uh, it was his turn to pray at the dinner table. And as we all bowed our heads and clasped hands, he he was praying for all the things on his plate, you know, for the green peas and for, this, and for the meatloaf. And he, he was looking around and thinking about all that. Then he started down the list of, of people, praying for people. And he had this long pause after, you know, he prayed for everybody at the table. And then he started thinking about his extended family and, he's, and he stopped. And I remember Jacob saying to him, whispering, and for granny and granddad and my mom and papa. And Micah said, don't say to me, Jacob, in the middle of the prayer. Don't say to me, Jacob. Well, he was just trying to help him to know what to say. But sometimes we get maybe a little offended if we're not careful when people try to say to us what to pray and how to pray. Because isn't it, after all, a prayer just a matter of the heart? Of just pouring out our, our thoughts uh, our feelings toward God. And it's true that there is an element of prayer that involves that, what sometimes we refer to as supplication, an ardent specific request uh, to God about some struggle, some difficulty, some challenge, some problem, uh, some uh, particular opportunity that, that we're facing or that is before us. And we just pour out our heart to God. And we don't really try to muzzle that. And we just, God, here's how I feel. And you, you see a lot of that even in the Psalms sometimes where David just sort of pours out or even ruminates about something that's bothering him and a struggle that he has. And certainly that is one type of prayer. 
But there's much more that we need to be praying about. And you think about it. How do we learn how to pray? Isn't it often by hearing others and how they pray? We listen to what they say. We hear that and we say, that's a good phrase. I, I think maybe I'll use that in my prayer next time. And how many times do we hear the same prayer prayed at uh, the Lord's table? Well, uh, prayers don't have to be long. They can be short. I realize that and we don't want to take focus away from what we're doing here but we could even and I remember when I was a young man and uh, wasn't didn't have a very good attitude about this and sometimes we can be very judgmental about others prayers and we don't want to do that that's not what we're talking about tonight but I could almost recite verbatim what this friend of mine was going to pray every single time it was like a memorized prayer and we do that at the end of our prayers if we're not careful maybe using some phrases like guard God and direct us until we meet again well that's a good phrase to use guard God and direct us but it can almost be sort of like the attachment uh, an appendage that we put on that we haven't really thought about so we can grow in the grace of prayer we need to think about how to pray and one of the best ways we can do that is by looking at the prayers prayed in the Bible, but maybe even more specifically the next few weeks at the Apostle Paul, who was himself a man dedicated to prayer. Not only was he an inspired apostle that wrote what God wanted him to write, but Paul also, as God allowed him to use his own personality and the own sentiments of his heart at time, as God directed those things, spoke about Praying for the Philippians, for the Ephesians, for those at Thessalonica. In fact, in the New Testament, there are some 30 references that Paul makes to prayer. And there are several prayers that he analyzes or gives to us in detail that we want to spend time analyzing. And as we do it, I promise you from the Word of God, if you'll give your full attention to it, if you'll be dedicated to it, take a few notes and think about how we can do this you're going to find yourself drawing closer to God. You're going to be learning more about how to be a prayer warrior, about what you can say and what you can do. The very last lesson that we'll have, we'll actually have some practical ideas about what we can do to improve our praying, this grace of doing more of it and what we need to be praying about. Let's look for the time that we have remaining tonight at the Apostle Paul as we think about praying like Paul. And what does that mean? What does it mean to pray like Paul? Well, praying like Paul, as I examined all of this material in the New Testament and these references and sort of poured over them trying to find common themes and threads and things that he said and looking at that, there are four things tonight. And again, there are probably around 25 things that I discovered over the course of this study that were very compelling. But the first one that I noticed about Paul is the great emphasis that he placed upon prayer. Now we've already noted that by looking at some of the things that I've said already, but Ephesians 6 reminds us that Paul says, look, we need to pray in the Spirit. We need to pray with supplication. We need to allow this to be a part of our warring against the devil. Because while we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, we do war against principalities, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so if there is something evil amiss, or something amiss in our life, or something evil going on in our lives or in the world, Paul says we need to be praying about it. It is absolutely critical and essential. So whether it's in Ephesians 6.18 or the many passages that we examine in Scripture, it is very evident that Paul places a high value on prayer. But number two, I want us to consider this. We will pray like Paul, or praying like Paul means this, that we will speak and talk about prayer with others. Take a look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. Notice what Paul says as he prays, as he speaks about the love and concern that he has for the brethren at Philippi. And he says in verse number 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day 
until now. Paul has this prayer of thanks. He says, look, I have been thanking God for you. And here's what I've been thanking Him about. When was the last time we did that? When we just went up to someone or even wrote them a letter and said, Brother, sister, I've been praying for you. And I've been praying this, and I've been praying that I know while you're going through this struggle that everything will go well. Uh, I remember one time getting a, a text uh, before one of the boys got married, and uh, it was a prayer, it was a, a text from uh, an elder in a congregation somewhere else. And he said, just want you to know we're thinking about you today on this great day and praying for you. I want you to be encouraged. I get, prayer, I get texts like that sometimes from uh, my fellow preachers, Jacob sends those to me occasionally and say, just want you to know I've been thinking about you and praying. Here's what I've been praying about. I wonder how much that would change us. How much more we might grow spiritually if we did that with one another. Young people, that's something you can do with each other. You can send a text to say, I am praying about this. I'm thanking God for you. And not only did Paul tell the brethren at Philippi that he was thanking God for them. But he also said here's what I'm praying that he will do. Here is this prayer then of request that he says that their love would abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Now that's something that we're going to focus on in a couple of other lessons later on. What is the content of Paul's prayer? What specific things did he pray about? And I'll tell you we might be surprised. And when we compare the prayers of Paul to our prayers as I did, I was embarrassed. Because a lot of my prayers were very egocentric, focused on self and what I needed, what I wanted, what I desired. And going down even this long list of things that I thanked God for. Well, we need to thank God for all that He's given us. But I soon found that maybe what I was thanking God for in comparison to the list of things was it revealed that I was pretty materialistic. I don't mean that I coveted or desired to have things, but as I began to pray and think about all the things that I was thanking God for, it seems like the focus, a lot of it was on material things. So this study ought to challenge us to think about what it is that we pray about. And we notice that in this section here, that Paul, when we pray like Paul, we're going to talk to other people about prayer. We're going to discuss it. We're going to tell them that we're praying for them. And then number three, we're going to be constant in prayer. Constant in prayer. Yes, pray without ceasing, Paul taught in 1 Thessalonians 5. That is, as we go through life, uh, we ought to be praying. I remember when I was down in San Marcos in a young men's training class and as a college student. And Brother Austin Varner, who was an elder in the church there at the time, had been a gospel preacher for a number of years, a great man. Carl and I bought our, our first, well, I guess it's our only wedding set, really, our, 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 our wedding ring set from him. And I remember him standing up and teaching a class about this. And he said, you know, he said, there, isn't, there may be some things that we shouldn't pray for, but there isn't anything that we shouldn't pray about. And that's very true. There may be some things that we shouldn't pray for, but there isn't anything that we can't pray about. And so as we go through life, whatever it is, and sometimes people limit themselves. They, I don't want to bother God with that. Or I, I'd be talking to God about things that He already knows. And again, you're going to be surprised as you study this that God, yes, He knows everything. But He wants us to express the sentiments of our heart. He wants us to confess it. And the word confess literally means to say the same. We may know it, and God knows that we know it, but He wants us to articulate it. He wants us to say it. And when we do, of course, it turns a mirror on our soul. It reminds us of dependency upon God and who He is. But we need to be praying regularly, all the time. Paul was praying constantly. And we see, for example, in 1 Thessalonians 3, a reference to that. When, when Paul, as he had gone to Thessalonica to preach the gospel, do you remember that things were in an uproar there? They, they ran Paul out of the city, or they tried to, to uh, find him, that is. And so Paul and uh, some of the disciples had to get out quickly. And they took Jason before the magistrates, and, and while Paul escaped. And then Paul went down to Athens, and he found some receptive people there. They, they were more 
noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the, the word of God with all the readiness of mind, Acts 17 11. But then those from Thessalonica, these Jews that were trying to stir up problems, came down to Berea and Paul had to leave there. Now Paul had to leave quickly from Thessalonica, had to leave pretty quickly from Berea. And when he gets down to Athens, he is so concerned about what's going on in Thessalonica, he sends Timothy back up there. And he is anxiously awaiting news for how they're doing and what's going on. And in 1 Thessalonians 3, 9 through 13, when Timothy comes back with these good reports, Paul says, I was so elated, so happy to hear about these things. And then he speaks about remembering them night and day in their prayers. Some of us might do good to get out of prayer in the morning. Some of us may do good just to uh, pray before meals. But Paul prayed night and day. He prayed regularly. And so there is a tremendous emphasis on Scripture about Paul being constant in prayer. And a lot can be said about that. But our final point tonight is this. And one that we want to spend just a few extra moments on. And that is... As we begin to talk about and analyze the prayers of Paul, here is one that we can add to our list. If we want to grow in this grace, spend time extolling the nature of God. Our prayers oftentimes are limited to just simply addressing God, dear God. Thank you for, and then we list all the things that we thank God for. And that is right. And there are times that we have prayers of thanksgiving where our focus is certainly upon that. And then there may be prayers of intercession where we, we, we say, dear God, I'm struggling. And our whole prayer is about praying for someone else or praying for ourselves and what we need. And that's certainly appropriate. But what I see when I study the prayers of Paul, and by the way, other prayers in the Bible, is that there is emphasis given to the nature of God. I like to, when I think about praying, to start by focusing on that one thing first. Addressing God with great and grand terms. Where we extol, and what does it mean to extol? It means to speak enthusiastically about something. To extol something means to sort of expand upon. To uh, continue to discuss something with a lot of enthusiasm and excitement and joy and zeal. So if we extol the nature of God and even extol the name of God, uh, we're going to find that that's going to draw us closer to God because it causes us to think more about who it is that we are approaching. Jesus himself said, when we pray, we ought to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It is an indication that there is something sacred about God. There is something special about God. That it's not just sort of dialing up someone and say, Hey, how you doing? But rather, it is a recognition of the majesty, the greatness, the power, the love, the grace of God. Now, again, we might be tempted to say, Well, God already knows all of these things about himself. And you're wanting me to spend time uh, doing what maybe we normally do in singing. And true, it's a lot of songs that we sing. We spend time praising God. But many of the songs that we sing started out as prayers. Many of the psalms in the, New Te or in the Old Testament were set to music. They were written with a lyrics and a poetry or poetic sort of structure in mind as a means to communicate to God. And so when we think about these poems, these prayers, these psalms, many of them have a very high view of God, a very lofty view of God. I want to challenge you to spend some time speaking to God in lofty terms. Speaking to God 
with these reverential uh, terms that really remind us and that call attention to our heart just how great and wonderful he is. We might ask, well, what terms do I use? How can I approach God showing my reverence, showing my humility, showing my admiration? If you're like me, sometimes maybe your vocabulary might be lacking a little bit. So what do we do? We learn by listening to others. One of the first times that I remember hearing some of these terms used in describing God was when I was in San Marcos hearing Brother Norman pray. And he would use a phrase in speaking of God that God you are from everlasting to everlasting our eternal Father, our eternal God. Why did he say that? Because it's in the scripture. It makes reference to the fact that we understand the nature of God that it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. That he's omnipresent, that he's omniscient. That this is a God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. To borrow the phrase from the book of Hebrews about Jesus. Well, in the few more minutes that we have remaining, I want you to see how Paul does this. Turn in your Bibles, first of all, to 1 Thessalonians. Take a look at this prayer. So, as you think about praying tonight, maybe think about using some of the things that are represented here, that is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now, I don't know about you, but this is not one of those passages that I thought of in terms of extolling the nature of God until I started reading this in connection to this lesson about prayer. Because as Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 speaks about the righteous vindication of God, we know this passage, right? We often use it in reference to talking about uh, those who don't obey the gospel, to try to motivate people uh, to render obedience to the gospel. And we'd be right in reminding people about the justice of God. The God with inflaming fire taking vengeance upon them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. But I want you to notice in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 in verse number 11 as Paul speaks about praying for the brethren. The ESV says to this end we always pray for you, And then he says that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work. Well, none of us are worthy in the sense that we deserve it, but in the sense that God would make you worthy, that you would understand the worth and the value, that you would be sanctified and set apart knowing more of who he is. But some translations say this in rendering this Greek phrase in verse 11. With this in mind. With this in mind... We are praying for you that God would make you worthy. Well, what is it that Paul had in mind as he prayed about these brethren? Well, if you were to go back and look at verses 3 down through verse 10 and analyze that section of Scripture, there are two major themes that would jump out. And one is the goodness or the grace of God and also the judgment of God. <laughs> God, we recognize your judgment. We recognize your grace. That's one we always think about, the grace of God, right? Your goodness, God, your God of love. In fact, in verse 3 and following, we always give thanks to God for you, brothers, as it is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love uh, of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and afflictions that you're enduring. In other words, we see God working in your life and all the things he's done. Where does that praise go to? To the people or to God? He says, praise be to God. We give thanks to God for the power that he has, for the mercy that is revealed in their lives, for the showing of his kindness and love toward them and what they are able to do and what they are able to achieve because of God. But then in verses 5 down through verse 10, he says this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God. What's that? In other words, that they were enduring through their afflictions and through their difficulties that they were having to uh, 
endure. Paul says then, I want you to know that God considers it, verse 6, just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well to us when the Lord Jesus was revealed. And then we know this section of scripture. What is it? What is it that brought, brought Paul to the throne of God to pray on behalf of these brethren? It was both the grace of God and it was both the righteous judgment of God. We forget about that as we think about the totality of the nature of God and who he is that ought to want us to bow our knees in reverence, in humble submission, and in view of the world. God, we know it is your righteous judgment that's going to end up bringing, what, vindication, end up bringing punishment upon people. But that then lies at the heart and the story of the gospel of Christ because God must punish he is also seen as a God of love that wants to then provide a way of escape for those who are sinners. Well, there's a lot there, but there's one last passage that I want us to consider where I think we really see this. Turn now finally to Ephesians 1 and let's conclude our thoughts there in that passage. Because in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul, in speaking about another prayer now, uh, a prayer that we'll analyze in more detail later on with regard to the power of God and what he can do in our lives. He says in verse 15, For this reason, because I heard of your faith in Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you. And then here's what he wants them to do and what he wants them to become and what he wants them to know and what he wants them to possess. But prior to that, beginning in verse 3, there is a tremendous emphasis upon praising God. Notice in all these things here, in this text that we don't have time to really analyze in great detail. But if you want some terminology to utilize, if you want to really think about who God is and what he provides and extol his nature and speak about his greatness, there's a lot of information right here. Where Paul speaks about God as father. He speaks about him as being a giving father, as being a mindful father that he had in mind before the foundation of the world, the church. He is a God that not only is mindful, or a Father that's not only mindful, but He's a loving Father, as seen in verse 4. He's a Father full of grace and truth. He is a Father... Go ahead and go all the way down, Russell. Just bring them all up. I can't... This thing wasn't working again. Yeah. He is a sharing Father. But then I want you to consider this last one. He is the Father of glory. Now... The word glory is a word that we need to be studying in great detail. It's found many places in Scripture that speaks of in the Old Testament with reference to a manifestation of the radiance and the brilliance that emanates from the throne of God. That speaks to His power, His beauty. But then there is also in Scripture, particularly in the New Testament, that has reference to the glory of God as in reference to Jesus. John 1, 14. We beheld His glory. Talking about the incarnation. We beheld His glory. Talking about Jesus. God coming in the flesh. It was full of grace and truth. And so we saw the glory of God as revealed in Jesus. Well, what was it about Jesus that revealed something about God? His love, His greatness, His power, His goodness, His kindness. All of these things that reflect the awesomeness of this powerful, majestic God. But there's something else about the glory of God as revealed in this section that is connected on several occasions in verses 3 through 14 to blessings. These are things that emanate from the glory of God that causes us to want to therefore glorify God to speak in grand and great and marvelous and joyous terms happy terms about what God has given and so several times Paul says that these things were done or these things are given to us these spiritual blessings to the praise of his glory that they speak about who he is but this last phrase that he is the father of glory is a phrase that we need to be using in addressing God. God, you are the father of glory. James says it this way. James said, you are the father of lights. At other times it speaks of him as being the Lord of glory. 
Or we could use other phrases about him sitting above the cherubim, enthroned in heaven above. Or we read Psalm 90 and we read Moses' prayer and all of the descriptive things that he uses in, in, in speaking of God and then things that he did. See, there's something that we could really grow in in terms of prayer. God, I, I want to talk about all the great things you've done down through time, your redemptive plan. I want to speak about how you brought the people of God out of bondage. How you delivered them with a mighty hand. God, God, you are truly from everlasting to everlasting. God, you are not just holy, 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 but you are the Father of lights. You are the Father of glory. Now, 1 Timothy 1 verse 11 says this, that he is the blessed God. The blessed God. I'm going to stretch your mind here just a little bit. It might make you uncomfortable to even think about this to some degree. And if it does, I hope that you'll change your attitude about it. But the word blessed there is a Greek word that's found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Several times. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And sometimes that word blessed is translated or we talk about it as being happy. Not just happy with a smile on our face, but the intrinsic element of goodness and wholesomeness and satisfaction. Blessed. And so in 1 Timothy 1.11, when Paul speaks of God as being the blessed or the blessed God, is he not referring to him as being the happy God? The God from which happiness comes. The God who is the Father of it, the one who gives it and grants it to which so much joy can be realized and appreciated. I want to challenge us tonight as we think about praying like Paul to spend time extolling the nature of God in our prayers. And we can start with Ephesians 1. We can start with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We can go to Psalm 90. We can look at Hezekiah's prayer in, I, in the book of Isaiah and also in the Kings as he extolled his greatness. Let's spend time doing that. And when we do, we'll be praying like Paul. And we'll be all well on our way then to understanding more about his love, his greatness in our own lives and how he's revealed himself through history. We can encourage you in some way by praying with you, maybe baptizing you into Christ tonight, add you to the family of God by doing that, but also maybe you just want to identify yourself as a Christian and say, I'm ready to start working with this congregation and be under the oversight of the elders here and to be a prayer warrior and to be a worker in the kingdom of God. If that's you tonight, or if you have any need that we can help you with, will you come as together we stand and as we sing?